Hello and welcome to this presentation on demystifying the Hardwick Prescott filter with the easy to use HP filter package for R. I'm Alexandra Monapov, the author of the package, and I'll be guiding you through its features today. Let's look at the contents of today's presentation. First, we're going to be looking at what the Hardwick Prescott filter is and how it came about, the intuition behind the mathematics of the HP filter, the different implementation types and when best to use each method, as well as a case study of how the HP filter is applied to real-world financial stability policy making. The presentation contains several supporting documents. One is the documentation, vignettes, and download itself on the CRAN. And the second one contains a paper presenting the Hardware Prescott filter package for R and several real-world usage scenarios. The HP filter is a tool that facilitates the analysis of cycles in economics and finance. It is used to smooth out short-term fluctuations in data and reveal underlying long-term trends. The HP filter has become a standard in macroeconomics. It was popularized in the 1990s by economists Robert Hodrick and Edward Prescott, and it became a stable in fields like real business cycle analysis and finance. More recently, the HP filter became a key instrument in the central banker's toolkit. Although initially it was designed to study the evolution of GDP for monetary policy purposes, to be used in quarterly projections models or dynamic stochastic of general equilibrium models, it was later also prescribed by the Basel Committee as a means of calculating the countercyclical capital buffer guide. The HP filter is particularly useful when we want to focus on the big picture, and that is, the long-term economic trends. We therefore want to use it when we need to remove distractions originating from short-term noise. It's useful in studying business and credit cycles, determining, for instance, when the economy is overheating, quantifying the buildup of risk, identifying recurring trends or patterns of recessions, making economic forecasts. But it's also useful in conjunction with other modeling methods like vector autoregressive models or general equilibrium models. So, what does the HP filter do? In practice, the HP filter function takes a time series, like GDP growth, as input, and separates the cyclical component, or short-term fluctuations, from the trend, the gradual long-term movement of the series. Its output is a smooth trend line, highlighting the overall direction of the data. So we have the input, like GDP growth, credit to GDP, or other macroeconomic variables. We have the function itself that calculates the trend from the series. And then we can also calculate the cycle by subtracting the trend from the actual series. Let's look at a timeline of the history of research into the HP filter. The groundwork of the HP filter was laid much earlier than its popularization in the 1990s. In fact, in 1923, Whitaker introduced the mathematical basis for smoothing splines, which share some similarities with the HP filter. The method involved taking a least squares best fit to the data, subject to a penalty involving the squared higher order differences of the data. Just a year later, Henderson worked on simpler calculation scheme of the smoothing operations devised by Whitaker. In 1961, Lesser proposed a variation of the Whitaker filter designed specifically for trend extraction. In this method, which will become known as the HP filter itself, second order differences are used in the penalty term. 1981 marks the dawn of the HP filter. Hodrick and Prescott publicized the method in their 1981 seminal working paper by applying the smoothing techniques to business cycles. In 2002, a whole new strand of the literature emerged. Ulich proposed a rule of thumb for setting the smoothing parameter lambda, which determines how much straightening the filter applies to the data series. And here are the straightforward, if not simple, mathematics behind the HP filter. In terms of computation, the method focuses on two key parts. The first one is the split. As mentioned before, we have an original series Y, which is then separated into its trend and cyclical components. Then we have the objective function. To find the trend series, the filter must look for a solution to the minimization problem for the equation which penalizes variations in the growth rate of the trend component. And let's investigate this formula a little bit in more detail because this is an important one. So the algorithm aims to minimize two parts of this equation or of this formula. The part in green is the distance between the estimated trend and the actual observations. The part in blue shows the minimization problem of the change between consecutive trend estimates. 
And lambda, shown in black, determines the importance placed on minimizing the difference between consecutive estimates. Below the formula, we can see a figure that shows us visually how the minimization problem comprised within the square brackets functions. The smoothing parameter lambda also plays an important role. Consider the equation that we saw just a couple of moments ago. If lambda takes the value of zero, this means that the entire blue side of the equation cancels out. In this case, we're left with only the green side. The green side of the equation represents a minimization problem, which if we were to solve, would yield the result of yt, meaning the trend values equaling y, that is the actual observations. So when lambda equals zero, we have a perfect fit. The estimated values, the trend values of y, coincide with the actual observations. When lambda is close to zero, we have a close fit. The trend series closely mimics the input, but does not coincide with the actual observations. On the other hand, when lambda is large or very large, we would get a straight line. And this is because we would be minimizing the dissimilarity between estimates. As mentioned before, with the blue side of the equation, what we're aiming to do is to minimize the difference between the consecutive estimates. That is, we're minimizing the dissimilarity between estimates. If you look at the second and third observations on the graphs above and below, you will notice that in the case when lambda is very close to zero, that is, on the graph above, there is quite a significant dissimilarity between the second and the third observation. They are at different levels. On the other hand, when you look at the graph below, where lambda is very large, the second and the third observations are at levels that are very close to each other. There are several ways of computing the HP filter trend. We have the two-sided method and the one-sided filter. The two-sided HP filter considers both past and future data points when estimating the trend at any given point in time, which means that data points before and after the current observation influence the estimated trend. This is useful when studying long-term trends and when we're analyzing historical data and have information for, about future observations as well as past observations. So this would be pertinent when analyzing business cycles, long-term growth patterns, and structural breaks. On the other hand, the one-sided filter only uses past data points in its calculations. The trend at any given point in time, therefore, is influenced only by past observations. It's a suitable choice for forecasting or real-time analysis. Its applications range from real-time analysis, forecasting when future information is missing, and it also provides a backward-looking perspective on trends, reflecting real-time decision-making and policy analysis. There are, however, some implications in terms of choosing the trend calculation method. First, we have to think about the trend smoothness. The two-sided filter tends to generate smoother trends because it incorporates future information as well into its calculations. And this, therefore, it also potentially leads to an underestimation of turning points or short-term fluctuations. There is also the problem of end effects. For data near the beginning or the end of the series, the two-sided filter has limited or no future information available resulting in potential distortions in trend estimates at these points. Not relying on future data, the one-sided filter avoids end effects. And also revisions. The two-sided filter estimates can and will be revised when new data becomes available as the future information changes. The one-sided filter estimates remain fixed once calculated, reflecting the fact that they only use past information in the calculation. So why do an R implementation of the HP filter? First, well, we've had HP filter implementations for commercial econometric software like MATLAB and eViews. They've had both one and two-sided versions of the HP filter available for a long time, and they've become the standard in data series filtering. With the transition to open source alternatives, coding the HP filter natively for R presents an advantage. Then we also notice that we've had an absence in terms of a one-sided implementation of the HP filter in R. 
While R did previously have a package for filtering techniques, the one-sided version was absent, and therefore the HP filter comes to close this gap. It allows users to call both filter versions through the HP1 and HP2 functions. Furthermore, the HP filter package uses sparse matrices to produce its calculations, which means that it offers significantly faster loading times. This is particularly useful when processing big data, but also when we have large data frames consisting of many series and we want to process them all in one go by calculating individual trends for each one of the series included in the large data frame. So this brings us to the HP filter package itself. The HP filter package is now generally available. It was published and is now on the CRAN, the official repository for our packages. It can be installed just like any other package through RStudio's GUI or by running the install packages HP filter command. And now finally, let's look at a case study of how the HP filter contributes to guiding countercyclical capital buffer policy decisions. A word though first on what the countercyclical capital buffer is. The CCYB, as it's also known, is one of the key additions of the Basel III framework for banking regulation. It is a capital buffer instrument which aims to protect banks against exposure to cyclical systemic risk. That is, risk that increases in the upward phase of the economic cycle. In 2010, the BCBS, or the Basel Committee for Banking Supervision, issued detailed guidance on how the CCYB can be calculated using the HP filter to construct a guide based on an indicator called the credit to GDP gap of the economy. At its highest level, by default, the CCYB is designed to constitute 2.5% of banks' risk-weighted assets. So there are a couple of key assumptions made by the BCBS when they formulated their guidance. The CCYB is scheduled to take effect one year after it is announced. So it should use the latest available data in a predictive manner. And when we speak about a predictive manner, it means that we want to use the one-sided HP filter. Then also we note that financial cycles tend to be rather long, longer than business cycles, certainly. So they have a long peak to trough period. Therefore, the smoothing parameter has to be adjusted to take this feature into account. They recommend a smoothing a parameter lambda of 400,000, as this could adequately capture the length of financial cycles. So now that we've understood, in theory, how the HP filter is used by central banks to construct the countercyclical capital buffer guide, let's look at in practice at how we would calculate the HP filter with a case study of Ireland, which is aptly called a tale of two trends. This is because Ireland has experienced an increase in private sector debt to GDP up until 2014, and afterwards, a significant shift in trend had occurred with the indicator decreasing. This was mostly because of the presence of large multinational enterprises in the country, which restructured around 2014. And when they did, private sector debt to GDP started to decrease. And the indicator, of course, debt to GDP, credit to GDP, is an important one because it is at the basis of the CCYB. So we use it to construct the buffer guide. But it's also important because the commission, the European Commission, set an indicative threshold of 160% for debt to GDP sustainability, which means that in principle, values above that would be considered unsustainable by the commission. Now let's look at the calculations themselves. First and foremost, we would have to load the required libraries to calculate the HP filter. So we need the HP filter package as well as the ggplot2 package if we also want to plot our results. We then import the data. Here the data is stored in a file called irelandc2g.csv and we see a sample of the data in the middle of the page. We calculate the trends easily using the HP1 function here because we mentioned that we wanted to calculate the one-sided HP filter. Now the Basel committee recommends a lambda value of 400,000 that we plug here into the formula, but we also can test different other variations of the lambda smoothing parameter, and that's exactly what we do. So we test 50,000, 10,000, 1,600, and 100 for the lambda parameter. And finally, we plot our results. 
And let's look at what we can infer from these results in the graph on the right-hand side of the page. We notice that when the economy was in an ascending phase and credit to GDP was increasing, the indicator was above its trend. However, when the deleveraging process commenced, because credit to GDP was declining at a very fast pace, the indicator now started to be situated below its trend. We also observe that the highest lambda value produces the most rigid trend, and the lower lambda values allow the trend series to follow more closely the original data. We might also want to compare the one-sided filter results with those produced by the two-sided implementation. So we would do that by calling the HP2 function and again by feeding it the credit to GDP series as well as the lambda smoothing parameter. Here we compare again different lambda values and we ask ourselves whether a smoother series provides more meaningful insights. We notice that the one-sided implementation produces results that are less smooth, reflecting the filter's usage of only past data. But smoothness aside, the one-sided implementation also produces more persistent trends. Here, in the case of the two-sided filter, these follow the original series or the credit to GDP series itself more closely. And also a slide that shows us how the buffer guide is calculated. We notice the calculations here as well as the results that are produced. We see the cyclical component and the CCYD buffer guide in the graph on the left-hand side of the page. And on the right-hand side, we see the Central Bank of Ireland's official decisions which aren't exactly and fully aligned with the buffer guide because the Central Bank of Ireland decided to adopt a new strategy for CCYB setting in normal times, which states that in a standard risk environment, a positive CCYB value is prescribed. So to conclude, we've seen how the HP filter is a useful tool to smooth economic and financial cycle variables and constitutes a tried and tested approach. The HP filter package facilitates the transition to open source by providing robust and efficient implementations of both the one-sided and two-sided versions. And finally, we've seen a case study in the field of central banking where we've applied the HP filter to policy analysis and decision-making. And so we've highlighted this through a case study of Ireland's CCYB. I thank you for your attention, and here are a couple of contact details in case you wish to correspond by email or connect, for instance, through LinkedIn if you prefer to connect that way. Thank you again.